Thank you for this invitation. Um, so much has happened already this morning in this group. Um, I come from a community of learning, and I believe that I'm building on the work of practitioners when I do this. You will tell me whether this is true or not. I'm quite certain. Uh, first, let me get myself organized up here. Uh, I'm going to use this and walk around. Is this in the right spot? I don't know. Oh, down. Okay, not too far because I can't see the text then. <laughs> oh, but there it is up there. And then I just do this, right? And it uh, does things. It does, yeah. Okay, first let me, uh, I'm going to walk around with this. Um, first, let me tell you how I got into trauma theory and refugee studies and disaster theory. Um, I, was, I have spent a lot of my academic life studying the book of the prophet Jeremiah. And if you've ever sat down to try to read that book, you know how painful it is to read it. And um, as was the typical of scholarship during my early studies and really until quite recently, scholarship was interested in how the book got put together and all the different sources that were used. It was interested in the history of the book. And um, when I came upon work um, uh, of people who'd been among refugees and who were psychologists, anthropologists, and literary critics studying the effects of trauma on communities of people, I began to look at the book of Jeremiah with new eyes. In fact, I felt that the discovery of this set of studies opened up this prophetic book with amazing um, comparability. Um, so I wrote this book, Jeremiah, Pain and Promise, that Harriet already mentioned, in which I try to use insights from trauma studies to understand the book. And uh, I got that done. And I had been sitting on a, a contract to write a commentary on the book of Genesis for really about 15 years so that I could do my Jeremiah studies. And now I'm plunged into the book of Genesis. And guess what? Trauma and disaster studies come with me. And they, they are now, for me, opening up this magnificent book of beginnings in a brand new way. So I'm going to ask you to try to go with me as I talk about the ways I see trauma and disaster in, of all places, a book of creation. So um, I think I'd like to, I don't know how we've named this talk. I think we've named it a couple of different ways, but I would like to talk about Genesis as a book of beginnings to begin again. So. Uh, here's uh, what I'm doing. I think it's what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so my question is, why does Genesis tell stories of beginnings? It tells it to help the people start all over again after catastrophe. So I'm going to tell you what I accept about critical scholarship for those of you who've done biblical studies at any stage in your career as uh, a critical effort to understand our faith through the use of our mind in the contemporary world. So um, I agree with everybody who says the book of Genesis, along with the rest of the first five books, the Pentateuch, are an amalgamation of pieces from ancient memory until a much later time. So the book takes centuries to be put into its final form. Um, However, I'm interested in how the final form, the book as we more or less have it now, addressed the audience for which it was put together. So I'm shifting the focus from where it came from to how the book affects people. And here's the situation of that people. And I, I'm agreeing with general scholarship about this book. The book of Genesis gains its final form after the fall of the nation of Judah in the Babylonian invasions in the fifth, the sixth century BC, before Christ, the sixth century BCE. And in fact, it's probably even later than that. It's probably written to people when Babylon itself has fallen and Israel is still a displaced community in the Persian period, 
late 500s, early 400s. Okay, that's just to give you a setting. But the reason that matters is because the historical period was a period of catastrophe, of disaster, of displacement, of dislocation, of exile. Uh, okay, here they are. Um, I'm calling the audience the survivors of the Babylonian period. And um, I'll just mention some of the catastrophes, and you, I know, will be probably facing the echoes of this catastrophe in places around the world where you are now working and praying for whom you're praying. So um, the Babylonian invasions were three. 587, 597, 587, 582. So put yourself in the city of Jerusalem in 587, the worst and most catastrophic invasion. There had already been a lot of trouble. The king, appointed by Babylon, resists, doesn't pay taxes. The city of Jerusalem is invaded by the far superior Babylonian army. It takes two years to break through the walls of the city of Jerusalem. During that time, old and young die. There's a famine. The people lose lives. And finally, when the Babylonians break through, probably under Nebuchadnezzar, um, the destruction of the city is enormous. The temple where God had promised to dwell with them forever, the temple is destroyed. The king and his sons, uh, one of them is killed and others are carried off to Babylon. The um, economy is uh, uh, undermined. The leadership, that is people who own property, had money, could read, worked for the king or worked for the military, those people were by and large deported, probably with their whole families, in a forced march around the desert over to Babylon, present-day Iraq. The people in Jerusalem and the people in Judah, they themselves have um, been, their life has been completely altered. Uh, economically, and many of them, we know from archaeology, are displaced and settle in the northern part of the Judean region, the area of Benjamin. Now, what does that mean? It means that life as they knew it is over with. And it means, among other things, um, that uh, they are facing what the northern kingdom, Israel, itself faced. If you, I don't know if you know any of this history, this biblical history, but the Assyrian army invaded the northern the 10 tribes. And at the end of that time, there was almost nothing left in the region that becomes known as Samaria. We talk about the 10 lost tribes. It's because the kingdom of Israel actually gets primarily absorbed into the Babylon or into the Assyrian Empire because their practice of invasion is to displace the people. Now, in Judah, the sister nation that has survived the Assyrians is now destroyed by the Babylonians. Consequently, it is likely that they think the same thing is about to happen to us that happened to them. We will be absorbed by the other kingdoms, first Babylon, then Persia. We're done for. Catastrophe, destruction, and disaster. That's the historical world that the book of Genesis addresses. Now, I want to go on and say how, um, how I think um, trauma and disaster affects a community of people. Uh, first, I have to make a little parenthetic statement. Um, to take contemporary studies of PTSD and trauma theory as practiced in the United States, a Western country organized around individualized society, is a little bit dangerous to apply it to the Bible that arises from a community-oriented culture. 
where resources of resilience and survival are different. And of course, it's a before Freud and the whole development of psychology and pastoral care. Yet my claim about Jeremiah, and now of course about Genesis, is that these books gather up the cultural resources, the religious resources of the community, and turn them around, reinterpret them in ways that help the community survive. So I'm going to say boldly here, without the book of Jeremiah, also Ezekiel and Lamentations, and maybe second Isaiah, we wouldn't have Judaism, and then we wouldn't have Christianity. I want to add Genesis to that list. And I think, I, I think you'll see your own, your own practical worlds, if I would ever get to it, um, in this book, these, uh, Genesis. OK, so what happens, and you will have more to add to this, what happens to people who have experienced trauma and disaster? Well, um, in my reading of the literature, the best the best adjective to describe it, the effect of trauma, of traumatic violence on individuals and communities is overwhelming. Traumatic violence overwhelms communities and people. It takes away everything that people have known, typically. It um, deprives people of language. Um, as I understand it, traumatic violence, um, according to some people studying this at Emory University, um, traumatic violence can't be taken in as it happens to you because you shut down. Your, your brain turns off. You f your feelings turn off. And, and yet, the, the visuals of it, the fear, the somatic, the bodily response, is imprinted in your being, and so it keeps reoccurring and reoccurring, and you are continually re-traumatized in typical responses. Um, so, then you don't have language to talk about it. You don't have a way to describe it, and as a consequence, you're isolated from one another, often, not always. Um, so, if this is true, um, and, and let me say uh, one more thing. I mean, among the many lists of things that happen to communities who've survived, um, physically survived trauma, the most important one from a theological and biblical perspective is that trauma destroys faith in God, the world, community, other people. Of course, it seems obvious, actually. If God has promised that David will be on the throne of Judah forever, and the king is now in Babylon in prison, what happened to this God? If God promised to dwell with you in the land, on the temple, in the holy mountain forever, and that's been burned down, what kind of a God could this possibly be? If God has called you the chosen people and let this happen to you, what kind of God could this be? Obviously, so obvious, the Babylonian gods are the real gods of the world. The ancient peoples don't have the option that modern Westerners have of believing in nothing. It's, it, it's probably impossible to think about being an atheist in the ancient world because the world is so populated by the power of the divinities. For Israel, for Judah, the survivors of Israel, the question is, is there any future at all as God's people? And however can what's been destroyed be rebuilt? So what do you need if this is the case? Um, if, if a community of people have experienced traumatic violence and destruction of their world, if they are overwhelmed by it, it seems to me from traumatic studies that people need to re-enter the experience at a distant, far away, in some other representation so that it, they can get a glimpse of their own experience in stories or visions before them without being re-traumatized 
without having a kind of literal retelling of their experiences. And I want to show you how Genesis does that, some of the ways it does that. People need interpretation. Perhaps you know this already. When catastrophe has occurred, people need explanation. And in fact, a bad explanation is better than no explanation. Because no explanation means that chaos, chaos rules the world. That there's no place to find safety, nowhere to dwell, no way to enter this experience and come out again. You can't go on with your life. We know this even from studies about child abuse. Ch you, if, you've, if you've dealt with anybody, anyway, uh, children who are abused by their parents or adults typically blame themselves because they can't possibly blame their parents because their whole lives depend on their parents. So they blame themselves and they have an explanation. And then that not only that, they have a way to go forward because if they would just be a little more obedient, if they would just be quiet, if they would just try to be better children, then maybe what's happening to them would stop. It's an interpretation. It's a bad one. It's not an accurate one, but it's a way to go forward. It's a strategy for going on with life. Getting stuck there becomes the problem. Okay, so what do people need? I'm looking up here. What are you looking at? You're not looking at anything. Um, this is too far away from you. Um, okay, uh, so people need to re-enter the experience at a distance so it don't, they don't get re-traumatized. They need explanations or interpretations. They need to have some sense of agency, some way of taking uh, action and responsibility and going forward. And of course, they need hope. Now, I want to add to that, the people of Judah need to reopen, re-engage with the God who seems to have abandoned them to, or to be powerless. So I'm going on now. Please, if I'm talking too fast or you don't understand or I'm not making sense, just put your hand up. I'd love to be interrupted. And I have no idea about time. So uh, Harriet, uh, okay, you're, you'll tell me when at least 10 minutes left so we can have good, okay, good, thanks. Uh, okay, so um, I'm not the only one using trauma theory to read Old Testament uh, or Bible period these days. There's quite a, an interest in this. And uh, one of the writers is named David Carr. He's an Old Testament scholar at Union Theological in New York. And he's written a book called Holy Resilience. And his book, Holy Resilience, talks about the whole history of the Old Testament and how he finds there refractions of trauma. I mention it because I like the word ref refractions. Because refractions means you're sort of seeing through a lens. You're seeing hints of threads of trauma. And um, so I'm now opening to us the book of Genesis. And I'm going to point out, now don't get alarmed, this is just one way of looking at Genesis, but I'm going to point out some of the refractions of trauma that I see in the book. There's millions of them, which I never would have seen if I hadn't put Genesis aside to do Jeremiah. Um, the story in the Garden of Eden, chapters two and three, a creation account about the very, very, very beginnings of everything, is a story of the end of life. It's a story of people who are living in a lush, paradisical, paradisical, parad I don't know how you say that, in a garden of paradise. They're living there. Everything is wonderful. And through their own actions, they're cast out of the garden to face death. But they don't die immediately. We might remember they survive because God protects them. God makes them clothes out of animal skins, and they go on. Now, what this story does is it gives us a pattern or a plot of action. And it get that 
plot pattern gets repeated across the book in some of the texts that are most difficult for biblical interpreters. The plot is this. Life is good. Terrible things happen. The end is at hand. But the people survive every single time because God is with them. So I'm going to do this quickly because I really only want to focus on one of these and I didn't write it down. Um, think about Genesis 4. The, the family has been, uh, uh, I shouldn't assume you have the Bible memorized, though I'm sure some of you do. Um, the, that was a joke. <laughs> Hard audience. Um, if you think about the fact that um, they've, okay, they've survived, they're now out, they finally have children, and suddenly one child is murdered by the other, the family is over with. It, it ends. And the murderer himself, the murderer himself, Cain, looks like life is over for him. But no, God protects him. And they go on. It's not an end. It looks like an end. The story of the flood, one of the most interesting, is a story that begins with a, um, an introduction about sexual intercourse between the sons of God and the daughters of humans. And immediately after that, we get an account that God is fed up with human wickedness. Not the sons of God, whoever they are, but with the humans. And then begins the story of the unfolding of the great flood, in which everyone is wiped out except for Noah and his family. They're not wiped out because God protects them and chooses them. It's a survival story. Uh, the same thing with the Tower of Babel, where you have, you have the image of a city and its tower being destroyed but it's not the end of the people. It's about the scattering of the people. Um, and then finally, I want to mention Sodom and Gomorrah, this terribly difficult text to interpret for modern readers. But if you think about it in light of the destruction of Jerusalem and see one way of interpreting it as an account of the fiery destruction of a city and this few survivors, Lot and his family with Abraham survive. Why? Because the angels intervene and protect them. Now, what I'm saying about these stories, and I'm going to mention and look closely at Genesis 22. You might know what that is. That's the story of the sacrifice of Isaac, as Christians say, or the binding of Isaac, as the Jewish community refers to that text. That's another story of an ending. Um, okay, these, I'm going to call them all indirect ways of enabling the community who are survivors of the Babylonian destruction to enter their experience again, but at a distance, in a story, in a text, as if it were happening to somebody else on a stage, mythic, crazy, inexplicable something like the way disaster itself affects people. In the end, it's not really explainable by human causes. Now, um, so that's the first way I think that the book of Genesis is, an, is helping people who've already gone through a lot of healing through the prophetic literature. It's helping them now look at their experience and see it and understand themselves as the survivors, the survivors, they're the ones. And why have they survived? Why have they survived? They've survived, perhaps like the people in the stories, they've survived because God is protecting them. Now, uh, I think the next thing I'm doing here is um, talking about uh, moving from, the, say, the, these, these sort of more mythic-like um, stories. I want to talk about the promises of God in this book. Um, anybody who's looked at Genesis recently will remember that the first 11 chapters take place in a kind of prehistory 
and that when you get to chapter 12, you turn to the call of Abraham and his family, and all of the stories from chapter 12 forward are related to the promises that God makes to Abraham. And I'm going to add Sarah and Hagar, but they're not really in the conversation, but I'll put them in anyway. Um, so um, what these promises do is move beyond the catastrophe. But the catastrophe, the destruction of the nation, is always behind these stories. So, um, and I'd like to add um, the, th the theological claim that God in the book of Genesis is the God of the impossible because the community finds itself in the most impossible of circumstances. There is no future, there is no way out, there is no way forward at, uh, at the level of human insight. And yet, and yet, always there's a way forward. So let me try to show some of that. Um, uh, maybe you remember, um, may, or here's news if you don't remember, um, Sarah, who's Abraham's first wife, um, Sarah shows up in a genealogy at the end of chapter 11. And women hardly show up in genealogies of the ancient world. They're just not important. But in Genesis, they do a bit more. And Sarah shows up, and the thing that is said about her is that who her father is, and then that she was barren. The starting point of this story is barrenness. The woman is barren. Other women are barren. Rachel is barren until God intervenes. I'd like to suggest that this motif that runs through Genesis and all the way up into the New Testament is a motif of impossibility that the women's wombs represent the condition of the community. The people of Judah are barren. They don't know if they have life. They don't know if they have a future. And so it's not just a story that actually may or may not have happened. It is also at the symbolic level, a capturing up of the despair in the community. Similarly, the motif of famine, the motif that occurs, uh, it happens for Abraham, it happens under Isaac, and then of course it happens in the most glorious way under this, uh, Joseph. And uh, I would like to say that the issue of famine is another um, edge of life experience. It's another facing of death in these stories. And like the barrenness of women, the earth itself cannot produce, and this motif, too, carries with it end of life, another impossibility. And then the third motif, and the one perhaps of most interest to this community, is the landlessness of the people. So even if you are not deported from the city of Jerusalem, even if you're not, you have been displaced probably from your place where you're working, either as owners of property or workers on somebody else's property. You may have had to escape out of the city. Or you may have been taken around into Babylon as captive. But even if you're still in Jerusalem, you don't own the land anymore. The land now belongs to Babylon. They have bear it an invasive conquering empire, they have taken over the land, you are now landless no matter where you are as a person of Judah. You are a landless people. Now it is these matters that the promises of God to Abraham address. The book is obsessed with offspring. The book is obsessed with landlessness. The book is about migrants going from place to place to place. Why is it so interested? Because I think, I'm not alone in thinking, this is the condition of the community of Judah 
as the book comes into its final form. So the book is talking quite explicitly to this condition of the refugee, the immigrant, the migrant, the landless, the people who seem to have no future. I just need to think about these Syrians leaving and coming into Europe and looking for a place to settle and be and have a future. And the impossibility of this, the Afghanistanis, the, well, well, people you all work with and know far better than I do. So, okay, I'm out of breath already, and I'm just starting. Um, where am I going next? Um, I, will you hold on a minute? Don't go away. I'll give you. I have papers too, since I'm an elderly person, and it's quite important for me. Okay, to have paper. I'm sorry for the trees. Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna, now, here we go. Here's Abraham. Um, so here, I've mentioned Sarah is barren. Sarah is barren. The first words to Abraham in chapter 12, 1 to 3, are go. And this is a disruptive break, just as being a displaced person today is a disruption. Um, here we go and look at what God is promising Abraham. And let me ask you to notice the language as I'm reading. If you want to follow, if you have your Bibles. How many brought Bibles? Okay, this is the first time in my entire life as a biblical scholar to go somewhere where people actually brought the Bibles. Thank you so much. It doesn't matter whether it's Presbyterians or Baptists or Catholics or UCC. It doesn't matter. That's the way it is. Thank you. You've now, this is a new day in my life. <laughs> okay. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. First promise. Get up and out, get out of here. I'm going to give you land. These people have already gotten up and gone out. They don't want to, but they have. I will make of you a great nation. Isn't that impossible? I will make of you a great nation and make your name great so you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you. So this survival is not just for themselves, should it happen. It is for the whole world because God is going to work through this destruction according to the words of impossibility to Abram. So um, I, I um, put the words somewhat differently. Oh, I have to do it this way, too. OK, no, that's the one I just read to you. OK, so the, here's the command. Go, migrate. Well, they've already migrated. Land, offspring. Um, I'm going to give you a great name. In a culture of honor and shame, that you know about, perhaps many of you, in a culture of honor and shame, to have a great name is to be accepted. It is to have a place in the world. That's what's being promised to this community that has lost the war. It has lost the war, and um, that has utterly shamed the people. It has, and now um, God is promising them a great name and promising them blessing. All right, now, Abram, who's famous in, among Christian circles, and rightly so, because he's obedient. Um, I think there's other reasons that he matters more, but he is obedient. And he gives, um, he gives an example to the displaced community and the broken community of possible ways, implicit, hidden ways of restoring relationship with God, how do you do it? By obedience. So Abram went. He did what he was told to do. And the Lord told him, and the Lord, and Lot went with him, and he was 75 years old, and he departed from Haran. Okay, he's 75 years old. His wife is pretty old, too. And she's barren. And she is post, post, post-menopausal. And God is promising them an offspring. It's ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. But that's the point. It's an impossibility. And this is what God is going to do for them. Uh, so they go, and they go forth to the land. Here's a picture of them going, this terrible picture. Um, it's a painting that is so tranquil 
It looks like they're, it looks like they're on overseas adventure tour in the, in the desert. <laughs> They're just so calm, doing their doing their camel riding, but um, it's an effort. To, it's an effort to show us people, the family on the move. But I think, if we imagine them going, we imagine them in terror going, in fear going. So uh, somebody needs to repaint this. Okay. Our ancestors, <laughs> I, I provide a lot of entertainment unwittingly. Um, <laughs> our ancestors in the faith are all m migrants, immigrants, refugees, and displaced people. That's who they are. They are landless. And historians have tried to say they're among the many migrant communities moving around in the ancient world, and we know a lot of that occurred. Um, but um, I don't care about that. I care about the audience of this book. I care about the audience of this book. So every ancestor is migrant or displaced. And here I name them for you because they're part of our faith tradition and deeply important characters. And rightly so. Abram and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and his four wives, please know all four names, not just one or two, Jacob and Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. Most of us know Rachel and Leah. This is my uh, parenthetical uh, poking of you. Um, but the two slaves are Bilhah and Zilpah, and they're our ancestors in faith also. And then finally, Joseph and his foreign-born wife, Asenat. Those are the ancestors. None of them are stable. None of them are settled. They're all on the move. OK, so now of these, let me just look at the time so I know where I am. How much time do I have till 10.30? Okay, so uh, I have 10 more minutes. Okay, pick up everything. Here we go. Oh, I have, yeah, well, I meant 10 to talk. Uh, okay, um, Genesis 22. This, this shows you that I am a fool rushing in, rushing in, where angels fear to tread. I'm going in. Genesis 22 is one of the more difficult biblical passages because in it, God commands Abram, to take his son, his only son, his beloved son, the son for whom the book of Genesis has been pressing for 10 chapters, and take that son and bring him to the top of a mountain and murder him. And darn old Abram, he agrees to do it because he's obedient. And um, this, it, this is a text that has provoked interpretations far and wide. And um, I'd love to tell you, I'm here to tell you the truth about it, but I, I have an insight into it. I don't have the truth about it. Um, Soren Kierkegaard, the great Swedish theologian, says this is a picture of the, I'm sorry? Oh, what did I say? Oh, okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Forgive me. Oh dear, cultural a cultural faux pas. Um, so anyway, th that Nordic theologian, <laughs> that Nordic theologian talks about uh, the abuse of God. Who's here? This is an abuse of God. This is a God we want nothing to do with. This is the question that the neo atheists raise. Why would we turn to the Bible? when the God of this book is a murderer, a slayer of people, a vindictive and punishing person. Oh, that's what Kierkegaard suggests and moves toward. Then the great uh, Lutheran theologian, Terence Fretheim of our time, uh, talks about this also as the God, the abusive God. And when you look at it just in a cold fashion, it really looks that way. But I would like to argue something different because this is another text that refracts terror because it's about the promises of God, their impossibility overcome when Sarah becomes pregnant and finally gives birth to Isaac in bursts of joyous laughter. 
And now that very child that they both longed for, that is the fulfillment of the divine promise, is coming to an end. I think that the character of Isaac in this story gathers up the story of Judah and puts their own possible ending smack in front of them in a narrative fashion. Emily uh, Dickinson says about poetry, tell the whole truth, but tell it slant. The story is told at a slant, and it looks for certain that it's going to end. But Abram, Abram is f more faithful to God than to anything. So when God calls him and says, Abram, Abram, he says in Hebrew, Hineni, here I am. The writer, the writer is clearly making this a formal call narrative. This is, this is the formal time for you to come forward. He says, Hineni, and he says, take your son, your only son that you love, and take him to Mount Moriah, and there offer him as a burning sacrifice. Not just kill him, put him on fire, burn him as an offering to God. And then they go, they go in such dramatic terms, two or three, I can't remember, um, of his of, of Abram's servants and the boy and Abram prepares it so slowly everything is so slowly told and he gives the child the wood to carry and he takes the knife and the fire and then they leave the servants aside and go up to the mountain and the child Isaac says father father and Abram says Hineni here I am and the father and this child says, well, where is the lamb of sacrifice? And you will remember perhaps the answer. God will provide. God will provide. The story goes on, and then he, he binds his son and lays him on the altar. I have a picture. Okay. He binds his son and lays him on the altar. And... Uh, it's at that point as he raises as he raises the knife, here he's not raising it, he's getting ready to slice his throat, that the angel intervenes with the word, the angel of the Lord, or that is God, intervenes with the words, Abram, Abram, and he immediately says the word, you know the word, Hineni, 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 here I am. And God then tells him not to do it, he looks up, he finds the ram, the, the ram of sacrifice, substitutes it, and the story ends with the naming of the mountain, the Lord will provide. So what I want to say about this story is that it is not really an effort to provide a theology for us to understand who God is always and everywhere and every place. It is what was said about... Um, what, what uh, Robert Frost said about his own poetry. He said poetry is a temporary stay against confusion. I think these portraits of God as the punisher, the tester, the causer of horrors, these are ways people make sense after the fact. They're a way of trying to understand their experience in light of God. This one, chap cha chapter 22, speaks of Abram, of, th of this as Abraham's test. Now, how many of you have known people in your ministries who have horrible things happen to them and interpret it as a test? How many of you have had horrors in your own experience or that of others and say, well, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong that God did this to me? What did I do? It surely is my sin that's at stake. I think all of these are human ways to make sense after catastrophe. And that the problem in the Christian church, or I'll say my Roman Catholic church, I won't blame you. Um, in, in my Christian church, um, what I think happens is that this theology gets cemented. 
It gets put in place as insight into the very divine being, where in fact, I think this way the literature works is to try to help the community go forward by keeping God alive for them. I can talk more about that when my talking time, when our talking time comes. Um, I'm going to stay here. I'm, I'm going to just take over the room and stay here till about three or four this afternoon. You, yeah. <laughs> this, is a, this is a painting by Caravaggio. Um, he does the Abraham and Isaac story. Uh, this is a photograph by two guys from Texas. I'm sorry, I don't know their name. They take this exact, they exactly represent the Caravaggio but they leave out, you can't see it all because I couldn't fit it on the screen. I'm an old person, I don't know how to do this. But this, he's looking as if interrupted in the act of execution of the sun, but there's no angel there. Modern Western thinking, but something's interrupting him. And so this, this echoes this, interprets this. And then we look at our world and we say, we're still doing this. We're doing this to our children. We're doing it to the children of the world. We're doing it to the peoples of the world. And this book draws on the culture of its time. Where am I? Um, the cultures of its place to retell the story. Okay, now I want to end. I have to end. I'm skipping half of what I want to tell you. Um, okay, skip that too. Um, and where did that go? Over here. I actually taught this way, and you know, they, they kept me on. I don't know why. <laughs> okay, uh, here, th this is a, this, what I'm trying to show you. Um, what I want to share with my, from my work is that these stories get, f I, I believe they get, they get ossified, they get cemented as meaning one thing. But if I think about the audience to whom they are written, I think they're survival manuals. I think they're a path out of catastrophe and darkness and the pit of suffering, trying to show the people how to go on. I don't think Genesis could be written until all of the fire and brimstone of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Lamentations had already happened. And now the trauma in Genesis, the refractions of trauma in Genesis are just a little in few places. But every bit of the story is about survival. The horrors are diminished. And into this circumstance, or set of circumstances of impossibility, come the promises of God, and this will be my last word, the promises of God not only promise survival, they promise abundant flourishing. Abram is not just going to have this one son, in fact, he also has Ishmael, and he's going to have more offspring than the stars of the heaven and the sands of the sea. You all know that one. This is not just one child. It's saying to the whole community, you have a future. You have a future of God's profligate abundance, overflowing, prodigal giving. Similarly, you're going to have land and you're going to have blessing. So you get people like, you get people like uh, Abraham and, and Isaac who become wealthy. They get cattle, they get sheep, they get servants. The wealth is to me not an indication of the prosperity gospel. It is the blessings people need to survive who have nothing, they have nothing, and now God promises them more than nothing. God promises them a flourishing life. So uh, thank you very much. I have to stop, and I really want to hear from you, and um, thank you, thank you, thank you.